Tale of Shikunoko is a fantasy series by Leanne Hearn that takes place in the fantastical Japanese-style setting known as the Eight Islands. The series is a distant prequel to Hearn's Otori books, but I prefer these books for what it's worth. The novels work as a fantasy that's told like folklore, reminiscent of the Earthsea novels by Ursula K. Le Guin. There's violence and political turmoil, but the focus usually remains personal, and readers only occasionally see big battles because most of the characters live on the fringes of nation-shaping events. Hearn's concise writing, along with the themes of the series, help maintain an air of ancient writings. These novels call to mind Gilgamesh, Beowulf, Arthurian legends, or the stories of Taoist immortals. Even when the plot isn't propulsive, the style makes the audience believe it's reading an ancient and powerful tale. There's a lean, muscular nature to the prose. The setting of the Eight Islands is full of spirits, sorcerers, and magical items, which add a flavor of the fantastic from the start. The proliferation of magical items in particular, each unique with its own purpose, is fascinating. It's also just as interesting to watch these items pass from character to character to see how they affect the behavior of those who possess them. The stag mask and the magical book titled The Kudzu Vine Treasury Store, for example, are used and misused by various characters, and some of them, like the Sorgiato, are later found in the Otori series. The items themselves trace a path through the novels as much as the characters do, adding a layer of magic and unique flavor to the story. The casual nature of magic also means the reader might glide right over something extraordinary because the characters and the narration treat it offhandedly. I mean, this is a series where someone gets reincarnated as a horse, and people challenge mythical creatures to board games. So, of course someone can make a magical talisman from the decapitated head of a gray man. Everyone knows that. Of course there's a dragon child in the lake. Of course alchemists can brew a potion to make someone immortal. It is known Khaleesi. Although there are major arcs for characters that span all four books, these novels often read like a duology that was split into four separate books. The even-numbered books read more like the climax and payoff to much of the work that was done in the odd-numbered entries. In an interesting development, the climax often rests on characters going to present themselves, usually unarmed before the antagonist in an attempt to secure the lives of other innocent parties. At the point readers would most expect a clash of swords, something else happens. Hearn uses this twist to remarkable effects several times in the series. Thematically, there is an unintended conservatism to the book. When the Maboshi usurpers take power, there are natural disasters, and many of the protagonists explain this must be the wrath of heaven. Even Taka Akira, who is with the usurpers, thinks that they have angered the will of the gods. Aki says as much to him later. It is pointed out several times, however, that the Maboshi usurpers are more effective lords and administrators, in part because of their assistance on education, literacy, record-keeping, you know, all the unpopular but necessary systemic needs of maintaining a government based on laws. They establish effective courts, and adjudicate disputes without resorting to honor duels or misguided violence. The fact that they might be better leaders, though, is discounted, because they have sided with the Prince Abbot and support his choice of heir rather than the quote-unquote true heir of the Emperor. The effect of these arguments is to suggest that the status quo is the mandate of heaven, regardless of its morality, oppression, or other discrepancies. This view is supported when the natural world sometimes in the case of monkeys or horses, protect the character Yoshimori in dangerous situations, leading other characters to believe he is chosen by heaven. In its particulars, the audience may not reflect much on this, because it regards Yoshimori, who looks like he may grow into a reasonable man. He is a main character, and the audience comes to like him. As a theory, though, it's easy to see how this mindset can be easily abused to support an oppressive status quo. The destructiveness of prideful actions is a recurrent idea as well. Prideful men in particular cause damage that reaches far beyond the immediate circumstances of their vanity and disregard. This theme is seen over and over again, 
as Aratomo Moboshi alienates everyone with his paranoia and unquenchable lust to control the lives of his subjects. It is also seen in Masachika's constant scheming to rise to a higher station, even if it means betraying his wife and risking his already considerable wealth and standing. I mean, he gets a life way better than one he could have imagined, but when it suggested that he could have more, he looks around at his fortune and decides, it's just not enough. The character Kiko, too, lusts for power, disguising his grabs for money and authority as service, when he really only serves his own desires for mastery and recognition. Fittingly, in the later parts of the series, timeliness is explored as part of doing the right thing. Part of Tadashi's plan has been not to simply try and change things by force, but to ensure that the right people are in the right place at the right time to take the right actions. Getting to such a point, though, often means the characters need to learn what those sorts of right actions are, and that learning process tends to involve suffering. Shikonoko, Hina, Yoshimori, Bara, and Mu learn these lessons, sometimes firsthand from Tadashi, but more often through their own failures or being victims of their surroundings. Other characters, such as Aritomo, Masachika, and Tama, learn these lessons too late, if at all. Present in every part of the series is the concept of mono no aware. This is a Japanese term that roughly means a type of melancholy at the recognition of the impermanence of things. Sadness, regret, and longing dominate the novels, setting the mood early and maintaining it across all the years of the story. No character is spared. Confronting the inevitability of loss is one of the ways in which characters learn to have compassion and rightly regard the context of their lives and actions. The more a character learns to accept and move beyond impermanence and loss, the more the audience sees them as a character worth rooting for. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my overview of the Ishikanoko novels. If you like my work, you know what to do. Please live and be well.